You're listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek podcast. This episode presented by Associate Minister Julie Blinko. Today's Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 20. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, Unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, church, and I hope you've had a really special Christmas and enjoying time with loved ones and reconnecting with favourite places and spaces as you're able to. I always love this time of year, this time between Christmas and New Year's. As a minister, the lead up to Christmas is usually one of the busier weeks of the year and busier months leading up to it. And there just feels like there's a bit of a transit lounge in the few days after Christmas. You have this lovely time of leftovers in the fridge and that happy festive feeling. A few people, most people are on public holidays and you just get to be, you know, before the next year kicks in. And it's usually this time in our family tradition that my dad would somewhere ask me, so, Julie, what's your New Year's resolution going to be? And I've got used to him asking this and, you know, I'd have an answer ready. But one year I was a bit stuck on what my New Year's resolution was going to be. And I went to Google to find out, what is my New Year's resolution? I don't know. I haven't thought this far ahead this year. It was interesting to see. I went to Google. Can anyone guess what the top seven New Year's resolutions were on Google? Any guesses? Number one, top one was to do with health. Losing weight, getting fit, getting healthy. No surprises there. Number two, get organised. Third one was about finances. Spend a bit less, save a bit more, pay off the mortgage, save for that holiday type of thing. And then it went to things like enjoying life to the fullest, kicking off some things from my bucket list, quit smoking and spend more time with loved ones. As we come into 2021, Perhaps you're thinking, I'm not making a New Year's resolution this time around. I'm holding everything loosely and going week by week. Or perhaps you, like me, do like a little bit of planning. And even if you're holding it loosely, it's nice to know that there's a couple of things coming up you can look forward to. Either way, whether it's a New Year's resolution or just a goal and some goals and objectives you're setting for next year, I encourage you with something and I want to challenge you in something. I want to challenge you that if your goals or objectives or New Year's resolutions could be done in your own strength, meaning if you focus hard enough, you're going to be able to do it. If you set your competencies and your skills and your experience to it, there's a high chance you're going to get there. If that's the case, then you're dreaming too small. You're planning too small. I say that gently with love but with love, because as followers of Jesus, he gives us a much bigger perspective and a much grander uh, world vision than what we can simply do in our own strength. I encourage us to be people that don't just take care of our business, but take risks for the kingdom. And I think in this beautiful passage today, there's a couple of things that we can grab from this passage that helps us to do that. 
So this passage in particular, it was set, uh, Jesus was walking around, he'd finished walking around the Sea of Galilee, he was in Capernaum area, and his disciples had seen him do amazing things. He'd been healing people, he'd been responding to their faith, he'd uh, expanded the loaves and the fishes to feed thousands, and these guys had just come down from the top of a hill where they saw what we call a transfiguration of Moses and Elijah. Now, I'm not going to go into that right now, but the short version is they saw the glory of God on display. And they come down this mountain, you would think, full of faith and full of all these amazing things that they've seen and heard God do. And it gets to this story. A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or in the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And how does Jesus respond? We can see it in verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Oh, there's no hiding Jesus' frustration here, is there? He's basically saying after all that you've seen, after all of the glory of God that you've seen, that you've witnessed, and this, someone comes for help and you're not sure what to do. He's sort of saying, "God, guys, get serious about your relationship with God. Get serious about a kingdom perspective. I'm going soon. I've got Jerusalem on my mind and you're still thinking too small. It's like this urgency in these words. It's almost like saying even this man who brought his suffering son, he came to the disciples knowing that the disciples of the teacher would normally know what the teacher's about. So the, the man knew, if I go to a follower of Jesus, I should be able to access some of that same miraculous power, that same healing, that same stuff that Jesus is on about. They're his go-to people. And yet they they pointed back to Jesus, not sure what to do. And Jesus is getting really frustrated here. He goes on to quote a popular Jewish idiom, which is really still around in our English uh, language as well. Faith can move a mountain. But he doesn't use it as this strong encouragement of faith can move a mountain. He says even something the size of a mustard seed could move a mountain. In fact, verse 20, he says, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Now, I've got a picture here of a mustard seed. You might have some in your kitchen as well. They're one of the tiniest of seeds, not quite a poppy seed, but still quite a small seed. Now, often when people talk about this one, they say, oh, faith, the smallest amount can move a mountain. But let's have a look what Jesus was talking about here. It's actually really fascinating, and it involves the geography of the land. I'd like you to be a photo detective. Some of you may have seen this before. But I want you to look at this photo and tell me or tell the person sitting next to you if you're watching digitally, what you notice. Where do you think it was taken? And what do you see? You might notice the fields that are in the foreground. You might notice these quite sort of flat-roofed houses that are quite typical of ones in northern Israel, which is where it was taken, just near Mount Hermon. Or you might notice the skyline. There's a bit of a mountain here and then a bit of a, um, a saddle, like this, this mountaintop has been removed. And actually King Herod removed that mountain. King Herod was uh, a megalomaniac of the first century. If he was threatened by someone, he'd chop their head off or some other form of execution. In fact, even people in his own family, he arranged for them to be killed if he felt threatened or betrayed by people. He was incredibly insecure and incredibly powerful. And King Herod wanted to be remembered into future generations. And so he moved a mountain. He literally used some ancient construction technology to shift one mountain top to the one next to it. And if you go to Israel, you can see this mountain. You can see 
This is relatively close, but you can see it from the horizon, the mountain that Herod has moved. Now, something like that in the first century would have been news. You think of it today when there's something on the news. Oh, yeah, everyone's talking about vaccines. Oh, yeah, everyone's talking about job keeper, job, job seeker. People are talking about international borders, state borders. It's kind of the topic of the day, right? So I'd suggest to you that the topic of the day back then was King Herod. He was a dictator of terrible proportions and he moved mountains such that you could see them in the background. So let's read that passage again with that background context in mind. Verse 17, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. What he's saying is faith the size of King Herod's faith can move a mountain. Faith the size of someone who has no faith at all can move a mountain. It's no big deal to move a mountain. There's a bigger perspective here that he's calling his disciples into. It's kind of confronting, isn't it? It kind of challenges us a little bit about where our faith sat. And if we're living by faith, I, I wouldn't mind if I could move a mountain, you know, if the need came for it. I would think that's a level of high faith. But he's pointing out King Herod did that in his own capacity, in his own strength and for his own glory. And followers of Jesus, he asks us all to put our eyes to him, to do things in his strength, in his capacity and for his glory. If you could move a mountain with very little faith, what could you do when you know Jesus intimately, when you follow him, when you have the faith of God living in you, what kind of things are possible? The difference is that we've been given the perspective of God and he wants us to walk in that perspective. He said to the disciples back then, don't you remember the things of old? Don't you remember the things that you've seen? He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, don't you recall the things you've just seen recently? I want you to treasure those things. Put them in your heart and keep your eyes on me as the one who is able to do all things. And he gives us his authority and he calls us to the same mission as him. And he says that we will see even greater things than what he has seen. Now, as people on the other side of the cross, meaning post-Jerusalem, Jesus' death and resurrection. We have a unique perspective because we look back and see he conquered the grave in this. That cross that we celebrate on Easter particularly is not just a marker between one era of time and the next. It's also a connector between heaven and earth. It's also the bridge that Jesus allowed and made possible for us to know God personally. It's not just forgiveness of sins for all who ask or eternal life for anyone who asks, although that's amazing. It's also a marker in time of Jesus coming to make all things new. You see, he has a plan for this world to bring redemption, renewal, reformation, restoration, reconciliation between us and God and between us and other people. It's a game changer for what's going on around us. And so when this man in the story came with his suffering son to the disciples, my son who has seizures, my son who throws himself into the fire, throws himself into the water, can you imagine how that must have been for the father or for the family of that boy? How much the son must have suffered, but also how much the family would have suffered. I imagine the anxiety levels would be high, constantly watching him to make sure he doesn't harm himself and, and wondering what kind of life and future he would have for himself. He probably had burn marks on him if he was throwing himself into the fire. And he, in his desperation, he came to the disciples, can you help me? And he says they couldn't. And he didn't stop there, he pressed forward further going, Jesus, can you help me? 
And he, he says, Lord, have mercy, as he bends down on his knee. We're told that in that instant, Jesus delivered him, the son, from the demon, and he was healed from that moment. It's the kind of um, representation he wants on the earth around him. This is what Jesus is able to do. This is what he asks of his followers, to become a part of a world where we're restoring and redeeming, easing suffering, bringing the love of God one person at a time, but with a world vision in our mind. So what will this mean for you as you plan your New Year's resolutions? I encourage you, do make those good habit changes, do give thought, but bring an intentionality of faith to your planning. If you could accomplish your plans in your own strength, think bigger, lay it down for a moment and go, God, this was my plan, but what are you asking me to do in the world today? Now, as I've thought of this in the past, there's a couple of steps that I encourage. One is I like to think about God's worldwide plan. And I like to think which part excites me. Because, you know, there can be so much going on we don't know where to put our work, to, our hands to or our, you know, our work to. And so it gets overwhelming and we don't do anything. So I like to think, okay, worldwide God perspective in mind, which part really gets my heart pumping? Which part makes me passionate? Which part gets me thinking? Okay, if I've narrowed it down to that, what can I do there? And sometimes it's so huge we don't even know. So I encourage you, narrow it down to the next step. What's the next step? To make a phone call, to write a letter, to read a book, to go somewhere and talk to someone about what you could do. Take your step into that next step. Take a step in that direction. And as you go, watch for God showing you what the next step is and the next step. Because sometimes he gives us the big vision of what's coming, but sometimes, often, it's step at a time, asking us to walk by faith with him as we go. And then as we go, look for people around that you can love, that you can serve in Jesus' name. And I guarantee well, based on my own experience of what God's done for me, he opens doors, he opens doors, and he always responds to people that step out in faith, looking to him and trusting in him. I encourage you, as I finish up here, to take a moment to consider this in your own time. Have a look at the different characters in the story. Do you relate to the man who's petitioning on behalf of someone else to Christ. Do keep going. What an awesome thing to do. Keep seeking God for that. Do you relate to the young boy that desperately needed the touch from Jesus? Do you relate to the disciples who, God help me in my unbelief. I, I believe you did that, but I've never seen that level of miracle. Seek God. Seek God. God, I, I don't want to just do good things. I want to... Walk in the power and authority of Christ to see this world changed in your name. Or perhaps there's some other aspect of the, of the story that you relate to. And I encourage you to sit with it for a bit and wrestle with it for a bit. And let faith grow and ask God, what is it, God, you want me to put my mind to and put my hand to next year? Which area can I step out in faith to and faith with? We participate in this through having our perspective, not on our own abilities or possibilities, but on Christ and what's possible in him. I leave that thought with you. I say a happy new year, and I'll see you, church, in 2021. God bless. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.